Hi, my name is Deshawn Carr, and I'm a policy analyst on the higher education team here at New America. Two cases currently sit with GOTUS, uh, Student for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College, and Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina, which could likely ban colleges and universities from considering race as a factor in their admissions process. If SCOTUS decides to overturn affirmative action, we can expect to see some damaging and rippling effects throughout the higher education system, let alone other institutions. Here at New America, we acknowledge that we are not experts on affirmative action. However, we are very dedicated to making sure higher education um, is equitable and accountable, um, fighting for inclusion rather than exclusion, so that everyone can obtain an affordable, high quality education. Therefore, we are very committed to using our platform to uplift those with deep expertise and knowledge to raise awareness and spark cohesive dialogue on creating, a future, on creating future policies um, to ensure that higher education institutions are a guiding light in embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. For those who will be tuning in, I would like to welcome Associate Professor at Boston University, uh, Dr. Jonathan Feingold. Um, and again, New America and I, we really appreciate you for taking the time to speak with us on this topical issue, or what some would say is the big elephant weighing over our heads in higher education right now um, from an action. Um, so just want to kick off our conversation, um, just to start by learning more about you and your work, and what interested you working in this particular policy uh, legal space. Thanks, Deshaun. Uh, thanks you so much for having me for this really critical conversation. So as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor of law at Boston University School of Law. I teach classes in property law, education law, and a few seminars on critical race theory. And I've always been interested in race and racism, not just as a moral prerogative, but really also as an intellectual endeavor. And one of the basic questions that a lot of my scholarship asks is, why have laws that prohibit racial discrimination failed to produce meaningful substantive racial equality in this country? Uh, and for you know, probably obvious reasons, that's one reason why I'm uh, laser focused on the admissions cases uh, implicating Harvard and UNC right now. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I, honestly, this is a great segue because um, you've been in this field for a while. Um, and probably following a lot of things that's going around around affirmative action. Um, but this is, I mean, honestly, this is not the first time a legal challenge to race conscious admissions has come up, and it probably won't be the last we hear of it. Um, but just thinking back to, you know, previous affirmative action um, cases, and I'm thinking about the Fisher versus Texas case, um, are there any differences between the pending cases of what's going on right now um, and do you think the higher education policy arena has changed since the last firm of action was kind of on the chopping block? So really good question. Um, and I will respond directly, but first a little bit indirectly, just by offering a little bit more framing. Because you, you mentioned that this is not the first challenge targeting affirmative action to come before the Supreme Court. And certainly that's true. But it's just important to recognize that since affirmative action programs first came on the scene, and you can see them really um, become more prevalent in the 1960s uh, after uh, major civil rights legis legislation was passed at the federal level, they've always been under attack. Affirmative action really isn't much different than your sort of a, a modest civil rights remedy. And it's just important to recognize that for the past 50 years, since the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, affirmative action has always been under attack uh, in different sorts of ways. And so it's nothing new. And if anything, just the continuation of a half centuries long uh, front against basic civil rights remedies. And as you mentioned, the last time a race conscious admissions case reached the Supreme Court was in 2016 uh, in Fisher v. Texas. In that case, uh, the Supreme Court reaffirmed Grutter v. Bollinger, which was then existing precedent that held that a university may consider a student's race, so long as that's part of a holistic admissions uh, process that is designed to promote student body diversity. So the question is, well, what has changed between 2016 and 2023? And I would say there are two big differences. Uh, the first is the court. If you had the same Supreme Court today that you had in 2016, neither of these cases would be before the Supreme Court. Why not? 
because Harvard and UNC are both doing precisely what the Supreme Court in 2016 and the Supreme Court in 2003 said universities may do if they want to take race into account in order to promote student body diversity. But what's different is that you now have a super majority of conservative justices who are who are hostile generally to civil rights remedies, uh, including affirmative action. And, and, you know, we could have a different conversation about um, why that is, but that is a really key difference because ultimately um, how cases are decided on the Supreme Court depends on who is in control of the court. So that's one difference. The other difference is the narrative. Historically, affirmative action challenges have positioned white applicants as the ostensible victim uh, of affirmative action. After Ed Bloom, who was one of the individuals that financed the Fisher litigation as involved in uh, the SFFA litigation, after he lost in Fisher, he announced that he needed to find Asian American plaintiffs in order to continue his fight against affirmative action. So the question is why? Why would Ed Bloom pivot from uh, white plaintiffs to Asian American plaintiffs? And there's a few reasons. One is that it is undeniable and we should not you know, ever tr try to skirt the fact that Asian Americans have suffered a legacy of uh, racism in this country. Um, but what that means is that if Ed Bloom, if anti-civil rights advocates can actually make Asian Americans the ostensible face of the litigation, um, that becomes a more sympathetic plaintiff. And it enables you to couch what really is an anti-equality campaign in the language or the rhetoric of civil rights. It also gives you a way to discredit a civil rights remedy like affirmative action that you can't do if your frame is that affirmative action is somehow pitting students of color against white students who we know enjoy different sorts of racial advantages. And we can have a long conversation about why the that narrative is problematic and fraught in different ways, but that's another difference. Ed Bloom strategically is trying to make Asian Americans the ostensible face of um, uh, the anti-affirmative action campaign. Uh, and then if you're thinking about policy changes in the arena of sort of higher education generally, I think there's two things that I'll just sort of name for right now. The first is that you've really seen a broader coalescence around what I think you can generally refer to as an anti-racist ethos, particularly coming out of the summer of 2020, when there was this broad societal recognition that we have failed to reckon with our own legacy of racism in the United States. Many institutions realized that if they wanted to just get closer to neutrality, they had to proactively, affirmatively engage in uh, anti-racist projects. But that has been met with a new wave of resistance. And I think we're going to have an opportunity to talk more about it. But sort of that rise of leaning into anti-racism has been met with this new anti-anti-racist front, which is trying to limit just the modest efforts that institutions are trying to take now to create more accessible, inclusive, uh, and equitable spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, you made a lot of wonderful and interesting points. Um... Yeah, on that question. And, you know, the thing you said, like, you know, they're using Asian Americans and Asians as a way to, you know, change the narrative because they know last time that using, you know, white students as the, you know, as a defendant or as the, um, you know, plaintiff here um, and it's not working. So they, it's like they're pitting races against races, like, you know, and it's, and it's not, it's not okay. Um, but yeah, and also about your narrative too, about how, you know, the court has changed. I think this kind of leads into my next question about what's also coming out of Florida and Texas right now. So going back to Texas, um, we're noticing that many interesting and I guess peculiar issues um, are coming out of these states, particularly a lot of, you know, conservative leaning states um, about, you know, getting rid of DEI um, efforts and initiatives. Do you think their actions are possibly a precursor um, to what we might see unfold nationwide if affirmative action is overturned? And what is at stake for higher education institutions and their current, you know, DEI efforts? What, yeah, what is at stake here? So really, really good question. Um, and let me actually back up by just 
spending at least one more moment asking the question about, well, are Asian Americans suffering discrimination at places like Harvard? And one thing that's really, really interesting about the evidence, the actual facts that came out of the Harvard case, is that there is some evidence that Asian Americans are confronting some sort of racial harm in the admissions process. But what's most interesting is that if you look at the plaintiff's own expert, their own theory of the case, it turns out that affirmative action is not the source of anti-Asian bias. Um, but the sources include uh, considerations like legacy preferences. It turns out that um, over 40% of Harvard's white student body are the beneficiaries of legacy and other types of bonuses that have nothing to do with anything we would ever think of as in their individual merit. And the plaintiff's own expert suggests that as much as 33% of Harvard's admitted white student body would not have been admitted but for that legacy bonus. And so I think it is important for us to ask, well, are like different groups confronting some sort of racial harm or some sort of racial barrier? And the answer is they might be, but the sort of ironic thing is affirmative action is actually a tool to uh, reduce or mitigate those sorts of burdens. It's not the source of it. Um, and the beneficiaries of anti-Asian bias are not other students of color. They're white and generally quite wealthy students. Um, but then with respect to your question about the broader attacks on DEI that we're seeing in Florida and that we're seeing in Texas, I think it's imperative that we recognize that this is all connected. Um, we're in this moment where there is a broad concerted campaign to roll back civil rights in this country. It includes the recent attacks on DEI efforts, but it also includes attacks on reproductive autonomy, on voting rights, on simply being trans uh, or a member of the LGBTQ community. It includes criminalizing protests. It includes banning books. It includes censoring basic conversations in the classroom about race and racism. I think it was today that Florida's Board of Education announced that it was expanding the Don't Say Gay law from sort of elementary school up through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So I think it is really, again, imperative that we see attacks on affirmative action as part of a broader assault on civil rights around the country. Uh, and it's not some hidden agenda. Chief proponents of this sort of anti-civil rights effort with connections to think tanks like the Manhattan Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Claremont Institute have been open that the goal is to return us to some pre-civil rights era, where the problem is not the underrepresentation of women or people of color in higher education, but that there are too many women and people of color in higher education. So it really is important to see that affirmative action is just one front in this broader battle between competing ideologies, one that you can sort of think of as defined by sort of the old status quo, really sort of characterized by rigid hierarchies, and one that is aspiring for multiracial democracy. Because like, just think, like, what are DEI efforts? They are modest attempts to cultivate institutions that are just more inclusive and more equitable, where everyone can enjoy the full benefits of university membership, irrespective of their identity against the backdrop of an American society that is steeped in many different legacies of uh, hierarchy, it actually takes a lot of work logistically and analytically to create organizations and institutions in which everyone can thrive. That's all DEI is trying to do. Um, but there is an effort to delegitimize, discredit these sorts of um, efforts um, and so then harness the law to actually prohibit them. Uh, and so I think we have to, again, see attacks on affirmative action as part of these broader attacks on civil rights more generally. Mm -hmm. And I totally, yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. It's like, it's, you know, it's like they're just changing up the wording, but we're like, if we can find a way to sneak in ways to, like you said, attack civil rights, uh, reproductive rights, voting rights, all those different things are base basic human rights. Um, that they can find a way to just, you know, ban or take away from, you know, com from communities that really need these things. Um, and I think you, you, yeah, I think this is 
love where this conversation is going. Um, but want to get your thoughts. I know you, you touched a little bit about critical race theory, and I know that you know this is something else is people are talking about banning, and also probably needs to be defined a little bit more because people do not understand what critical race theory is and what it entails. Um, but yeah, what 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 would a ban on affirmative action? What would that dialogue look like around you know critical race theory? And what yeah, what would that look like? What yeah, just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it's a really it's a really good question. What could a a ruling that prohibits universities from engaging in what really are the most modest efforts to try to reduce the degree to which race and racism otherwise might impact an admissions process? Just to out outright ban that. What does that have to do with CRT and attacks on CRT? And I think we can see a, a few a few connections. One is that. When the Supreme Court, as it's likely to do, outlaws affirmative action, implicit, if not explicit, will be a few empirical claims. One is that race doesn't matter, at least not until you explicitly make it so. And the other is that if racial inequality exists or if racial disparities exist, whether it's in admissions, whether it's in health outcomes, um, whether it's in um, being the target of police violence, Racism has nothing to do with it. Those are the implicit and sometimes explicit messages. So when um, in the following the summer of 2020, when President Biden is leaning into this, you know, the um, language of structural racism, and you have folks on the other side of the aisle who are denying that systemic racism exists in the country, implicit in that statement is that, well, if there's inequality, it's not because of racism, it's because of something else. And again, an affirmative action ban would be to say that if there is inequality in admissions, that is you know, morally, legally unobjectionable because it might, be, might have to do with something, but it's not this thing that we call racism. Because the moment that you admit that race matters, even if we wish it didn't, the moment that you recognize that racism is structural, that it manifests in ways beyond some sort of crude, person-to-person -person, um, animus-laden interaction, it means the following. If you don't account for racism, certain people are going to benefit from racial preferences all over the place. And it turns out in a society like the United States, that's going to be people who are racialized as white. And it's only by taking these sort of, um, deeply embedded systemic forces into account that we actually move closer to some sort of quote unquote meritocratic system. So what's that all have to do with CRT? Well, critical race theory is an academic framework that offers a set of vocabulary and questions and concepts that helps us surface all the ways in which race and racism continue to operate, even in a society that demands sort of formal neutrality. Uh, and it's just a system that helps us see all the ways that this thing called race is simultaneously like intuitive, but incredibly elusive and happens to shape every contour of our public and private lives. Um, but if your message is race doesn't matter, systemic racism isn't real, systemic injustice isn't a thing. And like, these are not actually my words, folks like the governor of Florida, um, and his representatives have gone on the record saying that um, wokeness or what it means to be woke is to believe that systemic injustice is real. If your goal is to purge those sorts of conversations from public discourse, it makes sense to try to ban students from getting access to just the, the facts and the concepts that will help them see and describe that world. A different way to put it is that CRT has always in part been this quote unquote boogeyman that right wing think tanks mobilize to try to scare people. But it's not just a boogeyman. It actually is a threat. If your goal is to prevent the American public from having just the basic vocabulary and framework to see the world in which they live and to see that racism continues to permeate US society in ways that actually can harm all of us. Um, not just people of color. And certainly it would be inconsistent with a critical race perspective to say that just because someone happens to 
uh, benefit from whiteness, they're somehow insulated from all the precarities that continue um, and just increasingly manifest in our society. But the thing is, critical race theory also just simply reveals that colorblindness isn't just morally, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, fraught, but it's also empirically bankrupt. And, and so, again, it's just important to see that CRT is not just boogeyman, but is also a tool that promotes multiracial democracy in a way that um, uh, is understandably threatening to someone if, you're, if your project is not multiracial democracy. Wow, I love the 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 the, the term of boogeyman um, linked to CRT. I might have to use that um, in the future with having conversations with people on this. Um, yeah, I, I think we talked a lot about um, you know ideologies and you know DEI efforts and CRT. Um, but want to get your your take on you know what you know what this ruling could potentially mean for just the future of our country's like workforce and economy. I know this is gonna also have implications. I know we talking, well, actually implications on graduate admissions, cause I know a lot of this is focused on undergrad admissions, but I'm just curious to think, thinking about graduate admissions as well too. And like, you know, our country's workforce and the economy. And I know this is, this has also come up with law, law school and medical school admissions. So just want to get your take on that as well too. So you can break down consequences into a few buckets, the legal, the material, and, e and even sort of the symbolic. So the one legal consequence is this ruling is going to further restrict the ability of public and likely private entities as well to take racism into account to promote racial integration in historically segregated institutions, to remedy histories of racial discrimination, and to reckon with ongoing racial harms uh, in the present. And the reality is that a lot of institutions are risk averse. And so even if there's space where they can continue to operate that might be consistent with the law, they're likely going to self-censor. And we've seen that in a lot of places where institutions, even when they are not required to do so, abandon or eliminate some sort of race conscious or racially attentive uh, policy. Um, and that should be troubling for all sorts of reasons. Um, but then let's think about the material consequences. And you can think of this in a few different ways. One is that we are going to be locking in racial inequality. Because again, affirmative action is, among many other things, it is a tool to try to um, mitigate all of the ways in which the society in which we live currently locks out a lot of people from uh, opportunity, not because of their sort of individual talent or work ethic, but because of the different sort of uh, force, um, forces or headwinds that they face. And we should think of this not just as you know, some sort of moral hazard if that's happening, but even if the goal is simply to have the best and brightest fill in the blank. If you want the best and brightest surgeons, if you want the most talented pilots, if you want the top CEOs, you are not going to get that if you have a system that is simply rewarding the students that have inherited the most social capital and advantage. Um, but that's where we're going to be moving to if you can't have programs like affirmative action that are enabling institutions to take into account of why different students might be differently positioned at the moment of admissions. Or put differently, think back to uh, sort of the pre-civil rights era. So Jim Crow, when you formally were barring uh, women from a whole lot of places, people of color for most institutions, you were by default not um, rewarding merit, you were rewarding mediocrity. Mm -hmm. um, and affirmative action policies were designed to try to just reshape those institutional arrangements that were continuing to lock out people who were um, uh, who should be there and were oftentimes the quote unquote best and brightest, but because of their circumstances, were not able to ascend to those um, places of privilege and prestige. So again, if our simple goal is to be, you know, in like in the, I don't know, the lingo of the like American mythology, like the best country in the world, that means that we actually have to um, enable the best and brightest to actually get into those um, positions of power and access those opportunities. 
Um, but if you are taking affirmative action off the table, if you are making it harder for institutions to actually account for the circumstances in which different students went from being born to making it into that admissions pool, you are going to inevitably lock out many of the best and brightest. And just from a, you know, from all sorts of reasons that should concern us. And the last is symbolic. And this is, I think, also really key. When you are locking in inequality and you are saying that accounting for race or racism uh, is problematic or is somehow a departure from this thing we refer to as merit, what you're saying is that racial inequality is legitimate and just. That is a deep, should be like deeply unsettling um, because what it is suggesting is that if you have institutions, if you have positions of privilege that are overrepresented by a minority of the country, then you're suggesting, well, they're overrepresented because they're somehow better than everyone else. Not that they have simply been the um, beneficiary of a whole host of you know, systems and arrangements that create a, a nice tailwind that push them ahead while holding everyone back. And so it is sending the message that 21st century racial stratification is not just like lawful, but it's also sort of morally just. Ooh, wow. Yeah, it's like we're going back, going backwards, <laughs> going backwards. Um, so I wanna just shift gears into starting to think about what federal policy could look like. Um, you know, at New America, we are, you know, very focused on federal policy, just given our location um, being in the nation's capital. Um, what would you like, you know, Congress or even the White House to know about the fallout of this ruling? And how could that decision affect federal policy? And what can Congress do to maintain and improve access um, for students of color? <clears throat> so I, I think you can think of this in a lot of ways. One is that it is really imperative that the White House in particular use its bully pulpit to make very clear to the American public what is happening and, and to make clear that a decision that is outlawing affirmative action is a decision that is outlawing a basic civil rights remedy. That is a decision that is saying, America, you might want to be anti-racist, but you're not allowed to. Um, in other ways in which the court has intervened in deeply anti-democratic ways to thwart the will of the people of the majority of the country who are committed to reckoning with our really ugly history that continues to shape all of our lives. And so it's really important that the White House make clear what this decision um, really is meaning and situates it within this broader attack on all of the pillars of multiracial democracy. Uh, whether that be education, whether it be voting rights, whether it be uh, reproductive freedom. Uh, I also think that it's important that the White House and the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, continue to leverage existing federal civil rights laws, including Title VI and Title IX, and remind institutions that they have a legal, not just a moral, but also a legal obligation to create institutional settings in which everyone, regardless of their racial identity, regardless of their gender, is able to enjoy the full benefits of university membership and to locate DEI efforts within that project. And to also make clear that attacks on DEI, to the extent they are attacks on some ideology, they are attacks on the ideology that is a commitment to multiracial democracy. Uh, and so it's, the White House should be clear that our institutions are not supposed to be neutral. We are supposed to be committed to multiracial democracy. We're supposed to be committed to equity and inclusion. Uh, and anti-racism as an ethos actually is required to get us there. I think it's also really important that the, that Congress, that the White House not um, censor itself and not overcorrect or overlearn the lesson of this case, but actually fight to maintain the policies that are necessary to 
realize a more racially just society. So you can just um, think about uh, the aftermath of Brown v. Board of Education or what followed after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Institutions that were committed to segregation did not fold. They got loud, they got strategic in different ways to try to maintain a society that was defined by racial exclusion, that was defined by racial hierarchy, that was defined by racial violence. It's important that the White House, that Congress, that everyone who sees themselves on the side of multiracial democracy recognizes that this is a moment where you can take a stand in different sorts of ways to stand up for the highest aspirations of America and not simply fall to a decision that legally limits the ability of institutions to, again, in the most modest ways, try to um, realize more racially inclusive and equitable and meritocratic institutions. Yeah, that's, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree on that as well, too, um, is bringing some of that, that stuff that we did back in the day, um, you know, the good things that these institutions were already doing to just hold the line and, and be vocal about what they're going to do with their actions and not just stand around and, you know, sit back and watch for things to unfold. Um, my last question, um, you know, just kind of just want to get your take on what would you like, you know, just for the general public, you know, take away from what is unfolding. And I think you probably touched on a lot of different things and probably can answer this question in so many ways. Um, but what is like one fear you have about the upcoming decision, but then also want to end on a good note, um, you know, what is one hope? So, all right, so a takeaway, a fear, um, and a hope. I think what I, what I hope, right? I guess maybe I'll go hope, fear, hope. No, whatever direct, whatever, um, uh, yeah, whatever, which way you want to go. <laughs> so I, my sense is that much of the public viscerally experienced Dobbs, the decision which the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade as anti-democratic, as um, extreme, as a just total disregard for existing law, that strip people of their equal citizenship uh, in this country. And I think it was really important to just feel um, the illegitimacy of that decision. I think it's important for people to also feel how extreme and anti-democratic anti a decision outlying affirmative action is, outlying race conscious admissions. This, the sort of policy that's under attack, the sort of um, policy that Harvard and UNC and countless other institutions employ is in many respects, one of the most modest ways that a society and an institution could attempt to reckon with a social phenomenon like racism that is so structurally baked into our society that it is affecting everything. Um, and so the other sort of the flip side of that is to recognize that nothing that is being challenged right now, none of the affirmative action policies, none of the DEI programs are in any way radical themselves. They are limited, modest efforts that came under attack in the summer of 2020 because we saw how little we were doing relative to how much we actually need to do. So I think important to see how radical a decision stripping affirmative action is and how modest these existing policies are. My fear is that this decision, um, if it prohibits universities from employing race conscious admissions, will chill a range of still lawful policies and practices that institutions could employ to mitigate, reckon with, remedy racism uh, in this country. Um, and embolden all of the anti-equality, anti-civil rights uh, efforts that have really come to define one of our major political parties, particularly in the last three years. But so here's so here's my hope. My hope is that the decision reinvigorates or continues to invigorate 
the pro-democracy, anti-racist ethos that I think has galvanized not just the country, but a new generation of Americans who will be um, leading this country and see the existential crises that they are facing, whether it's environmental, whether it's democratic, whether it's just an illegitimate um, uh, set of um, uh, sort of minority rule um, uh, forces. Um, and so my hope is that the decision is part of, you know, um, adds on to this sort of social fabric that is sort of invigorating um, this new generation of leaders um, that I think we are beginning to see rise up around the country. Um, because my guess is that democracy's best hope, that the country's best hope, that just our environment, sustainability, best hope will lie in uh, this generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, agree. Um, yeah, a lot of the younger generation who I applaud to them being very vocal and a lot of up and coming leaders who are, you know, getting behind a lot of these issues that are very prevalent to our society. Um, yeah, and, and this, this concludes our, our chat for today. Um, again, myself, New America, we really appreciate you, you know, being on board and talking and hearing your thoughts and perspectives about what is, yeah, like I said, what's going on. And soon we're on, currently on pins and needles waiting to hear the decision to come out. Um, yeah, thank you so much again, Dr. Feingold. We really appreciate this. Uh, thank you to Sean and to everyone at New America. It's really a pleasure to be um, in conversation with you all.